Cool. So welcome to our offices. Um, I'm going to go take a few minutes to go over what we do uh, and then talk a little specifically about what uh, data science at Flatiron looks like um, with the eventual goal of hiring people. Uh, so <laughs> keep that in mind, flatiron.com slash careers. Uh, I'll mention that a couple more times. Um, so yeah, before we get started in earnest, a few sort of programming notes. The bathrooms are, are right over there. And there's an emergency exit that way, sort of where you came from, and an emergency exit here as well. So with that out of the way, we'll get going. So a little bit about us. And uh, I'll start at a high level of like, you know, generally what our mission and uh, vision is for, for healthcare, uh, and then get a little bit more tactical and talk about what we do actually. <laughs> so we like to break sort of an overall description of the company down into, two, uh, into three things. There's our vision, our mission, and our positioning. And the sort of the easier way to think about this is the what, the why, and the how. So our vision is uh, to build a world where technology and science close the gap between care and research. So this is our what. This is what we want to accomplish in the long term. And our mission is sort of the why. Why are we doing this? And our overall mission is to improve and extend the lives by learning from the experience of every cancer patient. And as I go on, it'll become clear sort of how, you know, day to day we try and do that. And getting down to the how, uh, our positioning is that we're reimagining the infrastructure of cancer care. Um, so this is how we are accomplishing uh, our, our mission. So instead of like sort of hand waving too much, I think the best explanation of what we do is just by talking through our business units. So I'm starting to feel like a real executive now. Uh, <laughs> the main two are our healthcare and our evidence team, and they own sort of our two main products that, that sort of interact with each other. So our healthcare team is responsible for uh, point-of-care solutions in oncology. So we're the largest provider of uh, software uh, systems for community onc oncology clinics in the United States. So it's the software that, you know, if you've ever been to a doctor, you've seen them typing away, uh, writing notes about you. That's the software solution that we build for oncology clinics. And then our evidence organization, uh, which is what I work on, uh, we de-identify the data from, uh, that we collect from through our clinics, our clinical partners, uh, and we use that and sell that to our customers for use in research. Uh, so this general field is, is relatively new. It's called real-world evidence. The idea is, is that uh, sort of to supplement data that you're collecting through creating clinical trials, which can be very expensive, you can see, get a picture of uh, cancer patients in, in the real world and be able to do research on, on that. And then we have a clinical research team, which is sort of in addition to these, is trying to sort of bring our learnings and evidence sort of directly into healthcare setting. So helping to find, uh, you know, trials to enroll patients in more easily uh, and stuff like that. And then our international team as something that we're really excited about. We're beginning to expand uh, into other countries. So we currently have operations in the UK, Germany, and Japan, which is very exciting. Sweet. So some quick facts to, uh, you know, impress everybody. Uh, three million patient records uh, are available for use in research, de-identify patient records that we, uh, that the, our evidence platform uh, is able to provide. Across four countries, as I mentioned, um, we work with seven academic centers in addition to our community oncology clinics, which there are 200 of them, um, within which there are 800 sites of care, so 800 practices uh, that use our software. Uh, we have 2,500 employees. You could be one. Uh, and we have partnerships with you know, leading organizations around the world, from the FDA to equivalent organizations uh, across the world. Sweet. So getting more specific into data science at Flatiron, uh, you know, that Positioning, you know, the how we're doing things is reimagining the infrastructure of cancer care. And on the data science team, we're doing that with data science. So we currently have 46 uh, people on the team between analyst roles and, and scientist roles and, and other things like that. And we're growing. This is on the data science team specifically. Uh, we have open roles in a broad range of fields. And I'll go into some examples of projects that we've been working on recently. We've got some, some roles in using computer vision for radiology, so looking at scans data and seeing what we can extract from that uh, using computer vision and ML. We've got product-focused data science for clinical workflows at the point of care. So how can we make uh, you know, oncologists' jobs easier? How can we unlock uh, new solutions that will directly help patients you know, at the point of care as they're receiving treatment? And I'll go into an example of that in a second. And then the coolest, because it's my team, 
uh, is using NLP and ML to extract data from unstructured medical notes. So figuring out, uh, you know, trying to capture a full view of the patient journey from the notes that the doctor is writing about them and, and from documents that we're receiving from scans and radiology reports and stuff like that. So that's the general overview of, of data science. And then really quickly, I'll just go over two projects that we've worked on recently that we're really excited about and we think represent the kind of data science work that we're, we're doing at Flatiron really well. Uh, so the first one is uh, this uh, project that we worked on that recently was published in Nature Digital Medicine and deployed to multiple uh, oncology clinics uh, in the US. So we're using ML to identify patients at risk of emergency room visits. So, you know, obviously cancer patients, uh, you know, are, are at a high risk of emergency room visits. And that can be, you know, uh, an emergency room visit can be a very stressful situation, uh, you know, a big burden and a big disruption to someone's life. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to use our learnings from our evidence organization to build a model that can flag to doctors uh, in the real world which patients are at the highest risk of having an a, a, a emergency room visit or having to go to the emergency room in, in the next 60 days. And so we used ML to, to, to try and tackle this problem. Uh, we built a model and then in, integrated into our software solution. And we were able to accomplish an odds ratio of 3.5 for high versus low risk patients. So the patients that were flagged in our software platform were three and a half times more likely to be admitted to an emergency room uh, than those who were not. So we were able to you know, very directly intervene. And in those cases where they were high risk, a doctor would review that. And then there would be sort of acute, you know, proactive intervention for that patient to, to help, you know, uh, stabilize them if there's any difficulty that they're having to avoid the disruption of emergency room visit. So super excited about this project. I think it sort of really represents the kind of work that we can do from integrating, you know, all the research evidence that we're collecting through to, uh, you know, our, our leading sort of software solution at the point of care. Uh, example project two, what I'm working on, very exciting. Uh, so we're building the next generation of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, jargon here, but I'll try and explain it. Uh, <laughs> building the next generation of real world evidence, RWE is the acronym we have for it, data sets using ML. So uh, that data that I talked about earlier, the data that we take uh, from uh, our clinical data that we summarize uh, to try and capture a full picture of the patient journey so that, that can then be used in research, uh, you know, currently uh, that is in the industry generally, including what we do, that is sort of human labeled data. Uh, and obviously that seems to lend itself quite well to machine learning. Uh, we do have the highest quality human labeled data in the industry. And so what my team is working on uh, is how can we build models to replicate that performance. And the benefit that we get there is that we can respond more quickly to uh, you know, new developments in clinical research uh, and provide it at a scale uh, that is far greater than what we can do with human beings. So we can scale it out from tens of thousands of patients to our full 3 million patient network. Um, so yeah, it was really exciting. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, exciting work that has come out of real world evidence uh, research generally. So yeah, uh, enjoy the presentations. We're all happy that you're here. Uh, and as I mentioned, flatiron.com slash careers, or talk to me. <laughs> all right, thanks very much. Um, so I'm Steven, I'm an ML Ops engineer at Enteros, um, and uh, at Enteros, my team, we really like GitOps. Uh, GitOps has many benefits, uh, enhanced productivity, developer experience, greater security guarantees, um, consistency and reliability, and of course, peer review and communication. So we do our model onboarding with GitOps. This is where the term boarding pass comes from. When you want to take a project and you want to turn it into a model and deploy it, we onboard it. Um, and we can do this by automating scripts for each stage in our boarding pass product. Um, so this product for our ML engineers, it has all these stages that are defined um, in simple uh, YAML format in, for GitLab. Um, we have test, validation, um, we create our GitLab repo, and we create the AWS resources, which are, for us, in our case, just S3 folders and ECR repos. Um, then we create all of our integrations with Jira, Slack, et cetera. Um, then we update our deployment manifest, and then we create our monitors and clean up. Um, so you can see an example of how we actually run boarding pass right here. 
Um, it's actually quite simple, so simple that we made it self-serve for our ML engineers. Um, so when they have a model that they want to onboard, all they have to do is go into uh, the GitLab CI or UI um, and run hit run pipeline and then plug in all the variables, um, the name of their model, a description of their model, et cetera. And then we move on to uh, actually running it, which is the first step is to create the GitLab uh, repo. Um, so we store all of our model code in model repos along with our data as well because um, we absolutely love GitOps. <laughs> and the, to create this repo, we actually cookie cut off of this template, which includes um, serving code, model code, evaluations, our, um, also a folder for our data sets with our DVC setups. Um, and we actually can have multiple templates. Um, so they can plug in, when they run a boarding pass, the type of model that they're going to deploy, whether it's um, a spacey model or a multitask learning model, um, and we have a template for each of those that are actually contributed by our own ML engineers um, and what they actually use. Um, so to create the, uh, the model repo from the template, it's, it's really simple. We use cookie cutter to clone one of the templates down, uh, and then we commit the um, project to GitLab using the GitLab API. Uh, and then after that, we create the AWS resources. Uh, also really simple, we use Bodo 3. Um, we're very Python oriented at Interos, um, and presumably most places. Um, so we use S3, we just uh, create the S3 folder paths, um, and then we also create an ECR repo um, for the model container images. And then deploying is a bit more complicated. I'm not going to go too deep into it because this is just a lightning talk. Um, but uh, if you haven't heard of the concept of deployment manifest, I highly recommend looking it up. But anyways, our boarding pass, we basically up update our deployment manifest in each environment um, using a template for each uh, environment that we have. Um, so like our dev template is the one that deploys to dev. Um, we use cookie cutter the same as we do with the repos themselves. Um, and we clone down the deployment manifest, copy over the new template, um, and then we commit the updated manifest back to GitLab. Um, and then Argo CD does the rest of the work for us. I highly recommend looking into Argo CD if you guys don't already use it. Um, it's a really amazing DevOps tool. Um, and then after that stage, we create all of our integrations and monitors. Um, for us, this is just uh, Jira, um, Slack, uh, and we also use Datadog for monitoring. Um, so the Jira and Slack ones are very straightforward. We have scripts that automate the creation of Slack channels that do API monitoring and alerting. Um, we also have a JIRA service for servicing the models if something goes wrong, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and then creating the monitors is a little bit less simple. Uh, we actually have an open source tool that's available. Uh, we just call it monitoring. Um, but really, it's a, it's a repository of Datadog templates and monitors um, that we have for every one of our models. Um, so instead of having to really go into creating a monitor for each uh, <laughs> for each model that we deploy. We have just a simple template, so we don't actually have to adjust the thresholds until we have real data. Uh, and we actually have tools that now adjust the thresholds for us automatically, um, which hopefully will also be open source soon, but I can't talk about them. <laughs> uh, so what? Uh, this means faster everything. Uh, we were able to cut down our model appointment times from a matter of hours to a matter of minutes using boarding pass. Um, it really is just simple as plugging in your model name, description, et cetera, and hitting run pipeline. Um, the stages are also completely um, configurable in the sense that you can actually make it so if one step of the pipeline fails, the rest of them does do as well. Um, so that's been really useful for traceability as well. Um, so we can actually go and see every model that's been onboarded. Um, and if something does go wrong, we can see exactly which stage it went wrong in and make sure th those resources are not like messed up um, and fix them. Uh, we can also rerun specific stages in the pipeline if necessary. Um, and also, obviously, the benefit of self-service onboarding. We no longer have to do this work ourselves, which is nice. Always nice when you don't have to do something, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, not really time for a Q&A, but... Uh, if you want to learn more, we do have a blog post about Boarding Pass, uh, which shows some of the code and goes in a little bit more detail um, on our engineering blog. Uh, we do have some of our tools that are open source and more coming on our GitHub page. 
Um, and then if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at sbrownedenteros uh, AI or my colleague Amy. Uh, yeah, that's it. So I'm a lead data scientist at Cargill. Um, most of you probably don't know what Cargill is, so I will explain uh, what the company does and also what the data science team does at Cargill. So uh, first of all, uh, Cargill is uh, the largest private company in the US and it has been for many decades actually. And we are in more than 100 countries, actually 70, but we sell to more than 100 countries. We have been there for more than 150 years. We have more than 100,000 employees, and we cover many industries, actually, many different businesses. It's not only a single company, actually. It's a conglomerate with many different businesses. And this is just a summary. There are many other businesses, but we cover foods, agriculture, ingredients, uh, chemicals that usually are bioindustrials, actually. Uh, not only food for people, food for, for animals, too, so animal health and nutrition, um, grains, oil seeds, protein and salt. We also have some other parts of the business that may be unrelated to food, but they are also uh, about supply chain. We cover a lot of supply chain of food in the world. Uh, so I usually like to talk about the products that you actually find in the supermarket that maybe we can relate more to. Uh, so. Some flagship products, for example, are Truvia that you may have seen in a coffee shop or maybe you bought in the supermarket. Truvia is a sweetener made of a, a plant that's called stevia, so it's a natural product. Or recently we have a line of product that's uh, made of monk fruit. We have also the one of the most popular brands of salt in the supermarket and one fourth of the turkey that you eat in the Thanksgiving is actually from Cargo, so two major brands come from us. Um, one thing that I want to bring here that's very interesting is that we innovate internally in Cargo with our products, but we also uh, support other companies making innovative products in the market. So just a few examples that there's much more. This is uh, just a summary. But there's a brand called Puris that uh, we invest in that has a pea-based protein products. Uh, there's um, a brand in Asia that's making alternative proteins. In the bottom, you can see some very interesting things that are actually cultured meat. That's actually meat, but it's grown in the lab. So the first one, LF Farms produce meat uh, in a plant-based structure. So the cells grow in a plant-based structure. And the second one is Wildtype, is a it's something that's in the media very recently. It looks really like a sushi, right? So this has been grown in a lab. It's very expensive. One sushi like that, at least the last number I saw is like $40, but uh, still, uh, at some point it will be cheap and will be uh, in the market. So this is our team. It's 35 people. Actually, we have someone here that has been recently hired, Samira. <laughs> that, sorry for that, you are not here, but... <laughs> So maybe 36. We are part of a much larger team, research and development at Cargill. That's more than 1,000 people around the world. So I want to talk now about some of the projects we developed. Um, so just to summarize, all projects that we develop in the data science team, they are somehow related to um, the plants, factories, maybe farms, or maybe developing ingredients and products. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, IoT devices and things like that in our project, projects. This is one project we are really proud of, has recently got a, an award from McDonald's. McDonald's is one of our major customers. So there is a, a let's say, a machine learning model that actually uses um, images, sound coming from this type of warehouse where the chicken are and monitors the stress level of the chicken. And it has been proven to decrease a lot the mortality rate of the chickens in this environment. So it's a very, very interesting project. 
Uh, just to give a rough idea of, there are many projects, but this is just like a few that I pick to highlight what, what, what we do in Cargill. So in the computer vision uh, realm, for example, there's one project that's very interesting. They got a actual model of a horse, a physical model, where you can actually put air, inflate groups of muscles in that horse. They were using that in fairs to show to customers because we have a feed for a horse that's focused on like top level horses in competitions. So data scientists got that physical model of the horse, took 3D pictures of it, and now we are able to get the real horse, give feed to them, and understand what are the muscles that are growing in the horse because of the feed. Um, there's one project that's the quality of flakes of canola. For example, um, so canola is like corn. You can make like popcorn, right? So if you make the flakes out of canola, you can ex extract the oil. That's the way they, they make canola oil. And there is a computer vision project that keeps monitoring uh, a lot of canola oil passing in a conveyor and seeing what's the quality of those grains. Um, on the molecular modeling uh, team, we have, for example, uh, Stevie IP claims project. You cannot, for example, make a patent of uh, a plant, right? So Stevia that makes that product called Truvia, you cannot just patent a plant, but you can patent uh, strains of different plants at the molecular level. So if you really understand at the molecular level what you're doing, you can actually have uh, IP. Uh, the same thing for oil blends. We understand at the molecular level and know the blends that we are doing to achieve higher quality based on that. Uh, there are some forecasting projects that uh, actually I'm involved in one of them. It's more on the protein side of business where you have uh, manufacturing environments. There's one labor forecasting project. So we forecast the amount of workers in a given day in the factory because the, the workforce fluctuates a lot in this type of industry. There's an early warning system that's predicting, um, let's say, the, the down, sorry, uh, when the plant is down sometimes because something went wrong, we can forecast this more easily and tell the plant, okay, uh, go slower, for example, because you will have downtime if you continue at that speed. Uh, there's some more classical optimization projects that our team does. That's more on the modeler, sorry, modeling linearly some problems because some problems are really streamlined. If you want to optimize something, you don't need to use machine learning. So there's this type of approach in our team too. Uh, there's one project that's mix and blend of grains in elevators. Uh, sometimes customers will request a certain level of humidity, for example, in the corn. So you have to optimize what is the blend that you will do, and you need to consider what's the, the amount of grains that is in the market that you can use, etc. So you optimize these things. There are many projects related to that, actually. There's another one, and also multiple projects in one that I'm summarizing here, that are related to feed production. Customers come to us and they request a very specific type of feed for their animals. And uh, basically, we have to produce that in 24 hours to give to them because usually these requests are uh, quite urgent. And in the plants, in the factories, we have to deal with the, those demands and optimize what we are doing there to not lose resources and, and be able to, to produce that. So... Just to give now a sense of the DevOps side of what we do, um, because this is a MLOps meetup, right? So I wanted to bring some of this here. It can vary from project to project, but at least this is, for example, a pipeline that I have been following in my projects. We have cookie cutter project templates, so very similar to the previous presentation. We have some kind of template that all of our teammates, they follow, um, or at least follow as much, as much as they can, depending on the context. Of course, we push uh, code to GitHub. In that case, it was GitLab, right? Now, it, in this case, it's GitHub. 
This triggers a series of CI-CD um, steps. We use something called Vela. There are many scans that happen here, uh, security vulnerability scans, model confirmation scans, et cetera. There are dozens of that. It, got, it gets deployed to the cloud, specifically in, in Kubernetes uh, environment. In my project, I have been using things like Celery, uh, that you can schedule jobs in that. It logs everything in Redis that's also a uh, server in the cloud. Uh, sorry for the format, but it was not originally like that. There is a gateway, for example, for my APIs, and you have to authenticate, actually. So if you are inside Cargo Network, you can authenticate with your user to the API. You are accepted to see the data if you meet certain requirements, for example. So this is a layer that takes care of that. And more interestingly about machine learning, I use Datadog not only to monitor things like the hits to the API, for example, in the bottom. I also monitor model performance. This is not very usual, but actually, at least the way it's Datadog set up at Cargill, you are able to send some of that data to Datadog and be able to monitor that. Usually I don't send that to customers, but I, on my day-to-day, -day, I keep monitoring these things to see if I have anything that's breaking or not. Last slide. <laughs> so for example, in the plant, uh, you are producing a lot of data, like uh, a lot of signals. For example, in the bottom, someone working with boxes, there are many devices surrounding that person collecting data. In the top, there's a person that's maybe producing data and also reading some data from the monitor, you can see. So these things go back and forth. What matters is that there are many signals. Uh, there's a layer where you could tag those signals. Then there's another layer that this becomes information, analytics, right? So we would call maybe features in machine learning. Most of this is usually on-premise in the factory, so it's very hard to use that. Most of our projects have that challenge. Uh, things live on premise, we have to transfer that somehow to the cloud, where the database and the machine learning resources actually live. Um, some projects will choose to deploy the machine learning models in the plant or in the device itself, but this is very challenging. So this is just to give a rough idea of what usually we face in our projects. Um, I want to thank you, and if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Um, hi guys, thanks for coming. I'm really sorry to be the guy between you and another drink. So we're going to try and make this as fast as possible. Um, so I assume if you came all this way here, you can Google. So we're not going to chat more about myself. The only thing you probably should know is that I used to be an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. My company was acquired by Coveo. I've been doing AI and MLOps in the last couple of years at Coveo, and including a lot of open source. If you're into the sort of things, uh, we do also a lot of publications. So on the fancier side, the models, NLP, and recommender system. But don't worry, nothing fancy is going to happen today. Um, I want to start. I, I, I see some people here very young, like Lily, for example, and some older people. So I don't know how many remember this movie from Pixar. The fantastic movie is Ratatouille. Um, and it's a story about a rat, which basically is the best chef of the entire France. Um, and the motto of the movie is anyone can cook. Anyone can cook doesn't mean that every person on earth can become a great chef. That's obviously stupid. What it means is that a great chef can be hidden everywhere. And if there's one thing that I want you to take home today from my talk, is that anyone can build a great recommender system. Of course, it doesn't mean that everybody can build a great recommender system. My mom certainly cannot. And, you know, and you know, she has a lot of virtues, but not this one. But it means that a great recommender system team can actually be done anywhere. Okay? And I'm going to show you how. Okay? So uh, if everybody can build recommender systems that are great, why nobody does? Uh, so this is a um, um, chart that shows how many publications in top tier venues in e-commerce tech, which is my field and one of the major applications of recommender system, in 2020, you can picture the same in 2021, it's going to be similar. If you see here, everybody, literally everybody in this slide, except one team, you can guess which one it is, uh, is a large B2C public company. Okay? 
So it's the opposite of, you know, everybody can be a recommender system. It looks just a few people that can be a recommender system happens to work at Amazon, Alibaba, Etsy, Google, and so on and so forth. So why is that the case and what can we do about it? So there are, when you, when you look at the ML space, there are mostly two types of companies that are trying to build ML solutions today, okay? And, and you can see that in the, in the chart. There are people that are big tech companies that are AI first companies, the Amazon, the Alibaba, the Etsy of this world, the one that dominates the chart that you saw before. And then there's a long tail, especially the middle of this tail, of what we call the reasonable scale company, right? The company that are doing AI and they have a lot of value they want to get from AI. You know, Covero is one of these companies, right? But we don't have the infinite resources that, you know, Amazon has or the infinite amount of data that Google has and so on and so forth, okay? And the problem is that all the ML nowadays is done mostly by the company in the first class and not by the company in the second class. And this is due to, well, to many factors, but we can narrow it down to three. The first one is that implementing recommender system, like at a cutting edge scale, is very hard. There are very few people in the world, comparatively speaking, that actually understand this problem. Second, the models are just a small part of the challenge. So even if you could figure that out, then you have to deploy it. And everybody here in the MLOps community know how hard it is to deploy a model. You actually heard a talk about, you know, making it easier like, you know, five minutes ago. And finally, if you want to find good ideas, most of the ideas in the literature are actually about the Alibaba or the YouTube of this work. So it doesn't really relate to the problem that you face every day when you actually do a recommender system. And of course, we're making a terrible job as a community to help people start. We're not doing a good job of it, right? There's this, what we call big tech fetish, like right? this whole idea that the only thing we talk about is what Uber did or what Amazon did or what Google did. Um, I always use the met, I'm a terrible tennis player among other things I'm terrible at. Um, and one metaphor they always use is that we're all trying to learn how to play tennis and the only content that we consume is Roger Federer training. Roger Federer training is very good, it's very inspirational, but the chances of any one of you or me becoming Roger Federer one day is basically negligible. And even for the one that are gonna become a professional tennis player among us, it's not what we're doing today. What we're doing today is getting the ball on the other side, okay? And the content that is out there for the vast majority is either a World Data Science article about put, putting a scikit-learn model in Flask in production. It's not a real use case at all. Or then what Uber did with Michelangelo, which again is not a real use case at all, because guess what, you're not Uber, otherwise you wouldn't be you know, on Toward Data Science in the first place. So uh, today is about telling you that all the things that I said were true two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, but they're not true anymore. If you're building a recommender system today, okay, all of these things are actually not true anymore. They're not true because sure, recommender system algorithms are hard, but thanks to a bunch of new cool things, you can actually use a lot of open source to solve your problem. MLOps is hard, but thanks to a new ecosystem, and you guys know more about this than I actually do, you can actually figure out what you want to build and what you just want to buy. And finally, sure, it's true that the vast majority of literature is about YouTube problems, but there are some problems that you and BitTech actually have in common. So there's still something we can learn about that. And of course, why today I'm mostly just talking because I'm standing here without my laptop, we do subscribe to Linux Torvald uh, kind of tagline, talk is cheap, show me the code. Everything that I'm gonna say here is open source. You can go online on GitHub, everything is available for you and you can run all the pipeline that we're gonna explain today on your laptop with no cost. What we promise is that after a 10 minute setup, one single person, one ML engineer knows what he's doing, can run a cutting edge deep learning recommender system model with no help from DevOps and never touching infrastructure. So that's my promise to you today. And again, if you don't believe me, go on GitHub and kind of try it out. Uh, there, was a, there was a cool book when I was a kid, Learning Calculus, which is another thing that I'm terrible at. Um, and it is fantastic tagline. I don't know if you know the book. Um, the tagline is what one fool can do, another one can, okay? And today I'm your fool, okay? I'm here to tell you that if I can do this, everybody can, okay? So let's take one myth after the other and let's see what we can do to solve them. So the first problem remember is the algorithmic challenge, like building recommender system algorithm is actually very hard. That's true. But I believe we're closing to, we're closer to what I call the Akin Face moment of recommender system. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Akin Face, which by the way, I, they have an office in, in Dumbo here. And this idea that in NLP in the last couple of years, 
we kind of consolidated most of the things we know around a few architectural choice that solve the vast majority of problems, okay? In particular, it's transforming model for those of you who care about NLP. I think recommender systems are very close to this point. Like after dozens of years of research, we actually consolidate a bunch of architecture and building blocks that are, not in, that are known to work in most cases, okay? So if you want to build a new recommender system and you're new to the field, now you don't have to start from scratch. You can start with these Lego, you know, Lego bricks that has been prepared for you for the community and you kind of assemble them and you're almost guaranteed that they're gonna work decent enough for you to start, okay? Our choice for this is the fantastic library that has been built and maintained by a team called Merlin at NVIDIA. I know there's somebody from the team here today. Thanks for coming. Um, and it's a fantastic open source library that promise you to give you a deep learning uh, recommender system with an easy to use API. Of course, everybody says about his own API that they're easy to use, right? And so the question we, we set up to answer working with them was like, how easy are really these API? And the answer is very easy. They're actually surprisingly easy. So this is an excerpt from the GitHub project that I mentioned that have four lines of code. And in four lines of code, you can train a two tower recommender system model that is state of the art is gonna work with no changes on CPU or GPU, and it's gonna just work the first time that you actually use it. So four lines of code, state-of-the-art recommender system. So the second myth that we, want to, that we want to fight is the MLOps problem. I remember, now that we figure out the algorithm, thanks to, thanks to our friends at NVIDIA, thanks Adam, uh, what, what do we need to do? Well, we need still to do a lot of things, right? Because the algorithm itself is a small part of what actually means to, to run recommender system in production. Uh, this is a very famous uh, chart, you know, the, the, small, the, small, the small black um, square there is like the model and everything else is what's run the model. And the, there's this myth that, you know, putting model in production is so high. There's this famous Gartner report that everybody cites from 2019 that 80% of models never go into production. And honestly, half of my LinkedIn feed is actually full with people that complain that their model don't go into production. Uh, so what can we do to solve this? Uh, well, we, we produce a lot of content around this, so I'm not gonna bother you with this too much. But the, the key insight here is that there's a lot of MLDOPS tools that you can use to just do what you don't want to do, okay? Our suggestion for people at the reasonable scale, for people that don't work at Google, where Jeff Dean figured it all out before you came, but they work in a company that needs to kind of set up best practices, is to focus on what you want to do, let's say recommendation, and buy or reuse everything else. The chances that the tool that you're gonna buy or use are not gonna be okay for your use cases are near zero if you look close enough. I know everybody wants to feel special. I do as well. You are not, I am not. Most of your med use cases can be solved by off the shelf tool that you can download from the internet or that you can pay as a subscription. Everybody else that says the contrary is trying to sell you your like some something, okay? So just remember this. Uh, so the other thing that I wanna suggest is of all the things that you may want to not do in your life, infrastructure is the first one on the list because doing infrastructure is terribly boring. As you can guess, I'm also terrible at infrastructure. So one thing that I really like is to pay people to do that so I don't have to do it. Okay, so Jeff Bezos gets his rocket, goes to the moon, and it's fine, and I'm fine because I don't have to do infrastructure, so I'm very happy that Jeff Bezos goes to the moon. Uh, the uh, crucial point that we make in our journey towards MLOps, which again is super documented online, so you can find hours of me, you know, discussing this if you have finished Rick and Martin and you want something, you know, to add you with sleep, uh, is that we move from infra as code with infra in code. In particular, most of our infrastructure is actually declared in Python together with everything else. Remember the terrible Terraform that you had to learn? No more. Remember CloudFormation is even worse? No more. You can actually declare all the infrastructure you need in the same Python code that you know and love together with your actual model. So when you put it all together, uh, you get something like this. So you get a modern data stack, uh, the Snowflake, there's DBT, for those of you who are familiar with the data ops part of it. And then there's Metaflow orchestration to get from the features to the actual model serving prediction. And there's a bunch of other tools inside that you may recognize. We, we mentioned NVIDIA Merlin as a, um, as a um, uh, library for recommender system. Uh, there's also Comet here as an experimental track, okay? So you start with the, we start with NVIDIA model for cutting edge models. 
You add the modern data stack, so now you have scalable data ops. You add a Python orchestrator, in our cases, again, is, is Metaflow, and we'll provide abstraction over GPU computing, versioning, and so on. You add a tracker, for example, Comet, and finally, you add some SaaS deployment. You can run all of this without ever touching infrastructure, and you can now run all of this at terabyte scale by itself. So the suggestion that I have for those of you who are starting building an MLOps stack right now is start with the stack and the problem that you have, not with the one that you wish you have. Maybe someday you're going to be Roger Federer, but that day is not today. Okay? Start with the forehand today. So finally, uh, there are some things that you and big tech actually have in common. So there are some things that are common to everybody that tries to build good recommender system. And in particular, testing is one of them. Uh, we're just going to skip quickly through it, but I just wanted to, um, uh, to highlight why this is important for recommender system. So recommender system, as all machine learning systems, are typically evaluated with a train and test split, right? So you have some data set, you, you split it into parts. And then you take a measure, let's say, NDCG, MRR, or whatever you want to take, and you measure that on, the, on your held out data set, okay? And that's your generalization metrics. That's what you bring to executive to say, hey, this is how the model is going to perform in real life. Of course, that never happens, okay? And that never happens generally with any machine learning system. It is not a problem of recommender system in particular. But recommender system, compared to many other systems, are actually way more impactful. There's an argument to be made that the most impactful ML system of all time are actually recommender system. Think how many recommender system impact your life right now. Your, you know, link in your feed that maybe suggests you to come and go to this meetup. Your Facebook feed, uh, you know, Netflix movie, Amazon books, and so on and so forth. Your life is literally full of recommender system that is nudging you to do A instead of B. And when things go wrong, and this is just one example from the New York Times with Amazon recommender system recommending you a better way to commit suicide, apparently. There's a million of failure of recommender system to a very different degree of like, you know, how bad it is for people. And everybody that has ever built a recommender system, of course, me included, because guess what, I'm terrible at recommender system as well, as a story, as an oral story to tell about recommender system going wrong in production. So typical testing actually doesn't work. I can prove it to you. It doesn't work. I can prove it to you in extensively, but I just want to make an example so that everybody understands why this whole idea of having one metric over the adult set is a Terrible idea. So take these two, these two models for this is a movie recommender system, okay? And it's like a dumbed down version of Netflix. And the only thing that you can watch is a superhero movie or are Italian movies from the 60s, okay? Uh, I say it's a terrible version of Netflix. Okay, so, and you have two models, the model in blue and the model in red, okay? And these two models, you can see there, you know, the model they make 100 prediction about, um, um, uh, superhero movie and 10 prediction about um, uh, Italian movies and on the other side, you know, the, the other, you know, the other, the other thing as well. And these two models, when you measure it rate, oh sorry, this model, when you, when you measure it rate are going to be actually exactly the same. Okay. So model A and model B, model blue and model red have an it rate of 0 0.52. But if you look closely, you see that one is good at Batman. And it's also pretty decent with Italian lovers. You see the, the blue model there, it rate is 0 0.7. If you look at the other model, the other model is slightly better at Batman and is terrible at Italian movies. What happens? Since Batman movies, superhero movies, are the vast majority of what people consume, if you get a tiny bit better in those movies, you're going to get the same actually metrics that the model that is slightly worse at that, but is much better on a niche. What does mean is that the red model, to be a bit better on Batman, is destroying the entire experience of your Italian movie lovers. Okay? Of course, this is a toy example, but this happens all the time in production. Since consumption of items online is typically a power law, if you optimize just for the thing that people watch the most, you risk of basically screwing up everybody else in your user base. Uh, so how do, we, how do we fix this? Uh, and this is the moment where I try to sell you something without selling you something. Uh, so um, our team built Reckless, which is an open source. That's why it's not really selling. Uh, it's an open source library that we built to fix this problem. We didn't really want to build an open source tool ourselves because we suck at coding. But we didn't find anything that actually was, uh, was doing the job. And so we decided to build our own. 
Um, and if you guys want, there's still a data challenge that is actually open. This is the last days you can actually um, uh, you can actually participate, which is a data challenge on CIKM, where we ask people to build recommender systems that are not just accurate, but they are robust and they are fair. Okay. And so if you're building a recommender system, whether you want to use Reckless or not, honestly, but try to think very hard of what it means that your model actually works. Think very, very hard when you, when you present to your boss an improvement. Is an improvement for what? Is an improvement for everybody? Is an improvement for every movie? Is an improvement just for a few of them? Reckless doesn't tell you what is the right answer to that. That depends on your business. That depends on, you know, on, you know basically what you're screwing over. Okay, is it worth it or not? But Reckless is going to give you a principal way to avoid ad hoc analysis and to continue building boilerplate code to do this analysis. So you get your model, you get your data set, you send it to Reckless, and Reckless is going to tell you, you know, how fair are you, you know, how accurate are you, and so on and so forth. And one thing that I want to mention is that Reckless is a fully open source and is supported by incredibly you know, forward-looking companies in this space. Uh, Comet, again, we have some people from Comet, I guess, here. Uh, Neptune and Gantry. Um, and without them, you know, it would be much harder for us to actually develop this continuously in the open and continuously update all these features. So thanks, guys, for, you know, helping us out. And please go check out our page, our website, and our sponsors. So finally, after we hopefully solve the three myths that we wanted to bust in, so remember the algorithm meet, the MLOps meet, and the testing meet, what's, what, what's in the future of the reasonable scale at, for a commander system? And I like here three things that I wish the community would work on more. And so if any of you actually works in this team, please reach out to me because I'm very interested in, in all of them. So the first one is, how do we make better uh, training and optimization when testing offline, okay? This is a bit of a subtle point the recommender system has that other ML systems don't have. So what is the problem with recommender system? That by suggesting you to watch Batman, I'm actually making you slightly more likely to do so. This is very different than other things, right? For example, by, by I don't know, uh, predicting that you're gonna churn, I'm not gonna make it more likely for you to churn, okay? But recommender systems are actually not observation. Recommender systems are actually intervention, okay? And this, this subtle interplay between what you recommend to people and what people actually do is a problem when you test offline. Because again, the fact that I recommended you A makes actually a bit more likely for you to actually do A. So was it a good recommendation after all? So that's, that's, that's an interesting question. The second problem is deployment. Uh, so we cheat a bit on this in the repo, right? So deployment for easy use cases, like the one that I show in the repo, is solved. Like deploying model for, for trivial thing is a solved problem, like everybody can do that like in 10 minutes. But when you actually have an entire Merlin pipeline, when you have now a two tower model, a ranking model, uh, you know, needs like constraint of latency and so on, this is still a hard problem. This is a problem that requires a lot of domain expertise. And I wish, you know, I really can look, can, can wait, you know, for a future where I don't have to know all of this thing about how GPU works to deploy my models. And finally, and I mean, we touched about that with reckless testing and monitoring. I'm very passionate about testing. Uh, and as we said, performance on the test set is a very small part of how you measure how actually a model will generalize in real life. And the more your models, the more your recommender system has consequences on user, the more this is important. Of course, if you're building a recommender system for an app that very few people use, you know, you can sleep, you know, can sleep well anyway. If you build a recommender system for healthcare or, you know, or for product that, you know, hundreds of millions of people use, this is maybe, a, this may be a real problem. And again, if you want to use Reckless, we're super happy to use Reckless. But if you don't, still pay attention to this problem. Finally, uh, don't ask what the, what the reasonable scale can do for you, but ask what you can do for the reasonable scale. Uh, and this is a bunch of things that we've been doing in the last couple of years, which are, have one thing in common, which is the objective open. Um, uh, company above a certain size can, can have, you know, it can do research and a lot of stuff by just counting on basically infinite resources. But people at reasonable scale can just do, you know, can publish cool papers and, and do incredibly cool stuff just by working with the community. Because by, the, by ourselves, we are too small to make an impact, okay? And so if you're curious about what we did, there's a bunch of things you can check out. We released the biggest open source data set of all time in e-commerce last year for Sigaya e-commerce. We open source a ton of stuff, and one of the repo we discussed today is one of them. And of course, we publish quite a lot. So we try to also share all the ideas that we have, good and bad, 
well, good according to reviewers, but you know, that doesn't really count. Um, we try to share them with the community so that everybody can learn from ourselves. Finally, if you like this talk, or even if you didn't, uh, just please show your appreciation, go online, check our open source repertories, add a start to reckless so that you know, we, can, we, can, we can share it even more. Uh, and if there's anything that I said today that kind of resonates with the problem that you're having or the thing they're trying to build, please reach out, I'm very easy to reach. Uh, this is a quote by you know, a very famous guy. He used to say, we can always see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. That's appropriate for many, many, many things. And of course, recommended system is one of the things that is appropriate for. And as I always say, let's not forget, it's up to us to get it done. Thank you.